Okay. Um, let's begin. I hear some mumbling over there. What was the super special property? Uh, uh, there were orthogonals to both zero and no vectors. That's the whole point of the cross property. It's still going to be prepared for the cross perpendicular, right? Yeah, perpendicular is fine. Um, but try to get into used to using orthogonal. It makes it sound more <laughs> sophisticated. <laughs> You're our father. Mm -hmm. ah. that's, how you, that's how you weed out the algebra students. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you're talking algebra students, you say our father. Like, oh, what does that mean? College math. So, does that mean dentistry? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can ever be as smart as you. Okay. Um, questions on the homework? We have 10.4 DT, I think. Questions, questions, questions. Um, like five. Like, I got the first part of the question, but then they, they asked you to um, do something else. I don't know what the picture is for. They asked you to... Sarah, my student always gives me that thing. <laughs> yeah, you want to hand out? I got to hand out. Number five. Number five. Any, any one of that goes in that section. Just, I, I got the numbers right, but how would you justify it? Oh, you just uh, take the dot product. Oh, yeah. Verify it's orthogonal, how do you know things are orthogonal? The dot product is zero. So once you find the cross product, you just take the dot product of the cross product with each of the original vectors, and you should get zero. And that sort of checks that you got it correct. So this is homework 10.4. So this is 5. It gave us two vectors. A was the vector 1 minus 1 minus 1. B was the vector a half, one, a half. So a cross b. So it's one minus one minus one, a half, one, a half. Okay. Yeah, so you cross B, block out the I column, what do you get? Uh, <coughs> minus a half plus one, right? Yes. Then you block out J, what do you get? You have one half plus one half. A half plus a half, and then you take the negative of that. Then you block out the K, and then plus a half. You get one plus a half. All right, so basically the result here should be a half comma minus one, comma three over two. And so now you, you verify that you actually got the cross product, correct? So which means if you take this guy, a half minus one, three over two, and you dot product it with the a vector, one minus one minus one, the result will be a half plus one minus three over two, which is actually zero, so you know, it's actually orthogonal. There wasn't a number of the parallel. Yeah. Was it the second part of the parallel or the parallel? What's the super special property of being cross product? It has to be orthogonal. Yes. Okay. So you're supposed to verify that they're orthogonal. Sure. So, so the first vector you I see what you do with the dot product there. Like the first vector that column that is your cross product, right? Yeah. Okay, so you use a cross product and multiply it by the N. Dot you, product it with A. Could you have done it with B too? Or no? I have to do it with both. Oh, okay, okay, I see. The cross product should be orthogonal to both this and that. So to verify that it's a cross product, I have to dot product it with this and that. So then I have to go a half minus one through over two. I remember the dot product happens to be commutative, so it doesn't really matter who I took first. Um, and I dot product it with this one. Now. Quarter one a half. And so that a half. It's actually a quarter minus one plus two quarters. And that's actually zero. So that was it. So this is the verification part. This is actually doing finding the cross product. Cross product should be orthogonal to both this and that, which means if you dot product it with this or that, the result should be zero. If you don't get zero, you made a mistake somewhere, and you should try. Other questions? 
39. Yeah, so we sort of skip torque. Um, when you talk about torque, you're talking about a kind of rotating force, a force that will rotate an object around some axis or something like that. So for example, torque works in your car. You hear people talk about torque with cars all the time. But it also works with something like, you know, a bolt. You're screwing in this bolt, right? You're applying a force to this thing, which they usually use it as a force vector. There's a body here, which they usually represent by another vector, which they refer to as R. And torque is going to be the force that's going down to twist the screw into whatever you're screwing it into. <laughs> so that's tau is what it's called. So this vector is called the torque vector. It's telling you the direction of the rotating force. Right? So basically, you have that this guy is equal to R cross F. Because it's essentially the same as moment. So if you remember physics from high school, you know about the moment of a force is just the product of the force and the perpendicular distance from the pivot to the line of action. It's the same sort of thing. We can generalize it with vectors. And the product generalization in the vector case is actually the cross product. So they just mentioned that. So basically, you're just doing sort of the same thing here. Um, in 39, you have this bicycle pedal. Um, was here, was at 10 degrees. Oh, by the way, you can actually measure the angle between these guys, call that theta. And so if you talk about the magnitude of the torque, it's just the magnitude of R cross F. Which we know if we know the angle between these vectors, it's just R, F, sine theta. Right? So um, here you're applying a force at 70 degrees. The force is 60 newtons. Right. So this is like your F vector here. Your R vector would be along here. So that would be your R vector. The torque is going to be directed into actually the, the bicycle. Uh, and so if you look at the angle between the force and the object vector, the total angle you're moving is 80 degrees. So here theta is just 80 degrees. This means it acts for the magnitude of torque, so it's going to get the magnitude of R, magnitude of F, sine 80 degrees. R was given as 18 centimeters long, you write it in meters, so it's 0.18. The force was 60 sine 80 degrees. And I don't know, whatever that is. Yeah, we didn't really do that, but I don't know. So you only get the centimeters a meter? Yeah, you tend to use standard units, when, especially when you're working with newtons. Newtons have its meters. In it, it's a part of the. Right? Newton's uses like kilograms and meters, so you convert to meters to make the units consistent. Yeah. Well, you just kind of expect you to know that, and just do it. You just expect you to just like know that. Well, this I, I sort of skipped it. You could have just read this in the. There's like one little paragraph about it in the book. It's not a lot. To so, yeah, it's a very, very. But I, I won't test you on this again. I mean, you might see this. This will come up again in physics, but it's not. I'm not emphasizing it here. Just a neat little thing to know. Uh, he's 45. 45. We'll figure it out 45. <laughs> okay, so in 45, we want to figure out the distance from a point to a line. The point is not on the line. So here we have a line. Here's a point, P. Okay, and they, they actually labeled things first, so 
the line passes through the points Q and R. So we here Q, we here R. The vector, this they describe as the vector A going from Q to R. The vector B goes from Q to P. And I basically want to figure out D. And you basically want to show that D is somehow the magnitude of the cross product, blah, blah, blah. But what do we know about the magnitude of the cross product? Right, so in the back of our minds, you know, it's the magnitude of the cross product is equal to the magnitude of each and sine theta. And what's theta? Right, so I'm going to talk about, I'm going to put in an angle theta here. So how would I describe D? B sine theta, right, because this would be our right angle here. So basically you can say D is equal to B sine theta. And, but we know to get a cross product, what do we need? We need the magnitude of A, right? So how do we get the magnitude of A there? It doesn't exist. Well, because that's what part B does, right? Part B gives you the coordinates. Yeah, but we have to prove the formula first. Part A is to prove the formula. Right. You do that little sneaky math trick that you see math people do all the time. You multiply and divide by the thing you want to put in. So I multiply and divide by the magnitude of A, and then this part here is just the magnitude of the cross product. So I get the magnitude of the cross product over the magnitude of A. And so that's part A. Part B, we actually want to use this formula. Where is it? <laughs> okay, so in part B, find the distance. So now we know the point here is 1, 1, 1. We have a line going through 0, 6, 8, and minus 1, 4, 7. Which means I need to use this formula, I need to know what A and B are, right? My B is the guy here, my A is the guy here. A would be what? Yeah, 1, negative 5, 7 as a vector. Right, you subtract. Right? Because they, they told you who is Q and who is R. So you're looking at the vector Q, R. So you're going to take this minus this. So it's negative 1, negative 2, negative 1. And B is going to be 1 minus 5 minus 7. Right? So then your A cross B, right? you can just sort of, sort of do it here all in one step. So that's 14 minus 5, right? Then I take the middle ones. What do I get? Seven plus one. Seven plus one. That's eight. And then I make it negative. Yep. And the last one. Five plus two. Right? Seven. And so this means the magnitude of A cross B is just the square root of 9 squared plus 8 squared plus 7 squared. What's that? Radical 97 over 3. Or 194 over 3. 97 all over 3 like that? No, no, oh, because radical inside. Radical 97 over 3. Like that? Because you have the distance equals A cross B over... Oh, I didn't magnitude. do that yet. I just did A cross B. Yeah. So A cross... So the distance then 
Was this just 97? Oh, no, no, that's just radical 97. Yeah, that's just radical 97. Alright, so this sense would be A cross B over A, which would be radical 97 over 3. Because that 97 no, it's radical 194. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah nine, that was way too. Because that alone is like 81. <laughs> but then uh, the magnitude of A was radical 6. Magnitude of A was radical 6, which goes into that, which oh. reduces to this. Right, so that was 4 plus 1 plus 1, which is 6. So that's radical 6. Okay. Other questions? Mm -hmm. okay? uh, 53 of 5C. I don't have 52. I get rid of 50. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Did you actually do part A too? Or did you do 53? I part guess we'll just do 53. <laughs> uh, part A is if A dot B is equal to A dot C is B equal to C. 53, A, so if A dot B equals A dot C, does that imply that B equals C? Yes. What was your conclusion? No. No. Why is it no? Exactly. Yes. Why is it no? So we have like B is equal to 3 comma 2 and C is equal to 3 comma 3. With any value A is the same answer. It's not the same component parallel to A, but besides that, nothing else matters. The proportion parallel to A has to be the same. Well, it, doing what you said, make this 3, 2, and that 2, 3, yeah. then you can make A, the, each component has to be the same. Yeah, it's not really yeah, any vector. A can be, well, A can be any vector as long as it still works. Yeah, so some. I don't think any vector would work. Yeah. The vector would have to have the same number in each component. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Right? So then B could be 3, 2, and then C could be 2, 3, right? So you made this guy the same number, but then you switch the order of these. They're different vectors. But, if there was but of course, the dot product of this will be the same as the dot product of that, because you're just adding them together. But if that was, if A was like 1, 2, it would be different? Yeah. The dark part of it would still be the same if you were to No, one would be, uh, if this were it's 2, that would be 4 plus 3, which is 7. And this would give you 6 plus 2. So you make these the same, but then switch the order of those. Um, another way you could have sort of assumed it was not the case that this is true is to say, well, that means that that must be true, All right? Which the property says we can factor A out. So basically what this means is that A has to be orthogonal to B minus C. Of course, you, you don't have to make these two the same for that to happen. So that would sort of hint to you, maybe it can work. Let me start looking for examples. Um, what was part B? A cross B is equal to A cross C is equal to C. Start similarly here. So this is actually that. Which means A is, what could you say about A and this vector? Possible if B is not equal to C? Yes. 
Sure. Let's say I made a one one one, right? What do I know is parallel to that? Two two two. Any multiple of it, right? I can just say two two two. Is it possible for b minus c to be equal to two two two, but them not being the same? Yeah. Sure. I can make set b to be three three three, and then set c to be one one one. Then B minus C gives me 2, 2, 2, which when I cross Y with A will give me 0, which means this will hold, but they're not the same. So again, the answer is no. Okay. So yeah, you have the cross products are the same. With one vector being in common, it doesn't mean the other two are the same. Okay, what was part C? If both of those conditions are true, to B plus C. So we're doing both at the same time. And this is true. So if we do both of these at the same time, would it have to be the case that B equals C? What do you guess? Why? Right, so parts A and B, parts A and B show A is both parallel and perpendicular, or it's so sophisticated, or orthogonal. to B minus C, all right? So you have a single vector that's both parallel and orthogonal at the same time to some other non-zero vector. The zero vector is the only vector that can do that. So B must be equal to C. Right? The zero vector is the only vector that's parallel and perpendicular to any arbitrary non-zero vector. No other vector will have that property, so that's what we have. I really need to get a battery for my watch. I keep glancing at my wrist all the time. Okay, let's move on. So right now we're going to move on to 10.5. Equations of lines and planes. Okay, now, let me give a speech here. You guys don't have to write this down, but I've seen some crazy things before that I don't want to see again, so I'm just going to give the speech. Okay, so, you go to an algebra student, right, or a pre-calc student, and you ask them, what's the equation of a line? What are they going to tell you? Y equals mx plus b. Okay, now, if you ask an algebra or a calculus student, what's the equation of a line, and they don't know that, would you consider it weird? Yeah. It would be super weird for an algebra calculus, right? If there's one thing you remember from algebra calculus, it's that. You guys took answer in a few seconds. There are tons of things that I can ask you from algebra calc pre calc that you guys wouldn't remember. But you remember that. Because it's a basic fundamental formula. It's the equation of a line, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, at the same time, if you said to that algebra student, okay, is that a line? It's a function. They should be able to tell you no, right? And you would expect that. You shouldn't expect them to be confused. Yeah. Or if you said, okay, let's say they've never even seen that before. You ask them, is that a line? They should say no. And you say, why? It doesn't look like that, right? <laughs> There's not a constant here. There's not a constant here. There's not an x there. It's some other thing other than that, right? <laughs> Now, you might stump them for a little while. You might say something like, okay, is that a line? 
<laughs> there might be some like, oh, I'm not sure, you know. It's, it, it sort of looks like it could be, but yeah, not, you know, they, they try something, they're like, okay, maybe I know about this. I mean, sometimes you also tell them the standard form of the equation of a line, and that'll be fine, they might know that. But yeah, they eventually see that they could sort of work this out to look like that, right? Just subtract 2x and divide both sides by 3, and you get this one, right? But if you do something totally crazy, you're like, there's no way that could be a line. Totally crazy. <laughs> exactly. Totally crazy. Okay, so I'm just going to do a little spoiler alert here. We're going to derive these equations and stuff. But basically in 3D, what happens is we're going to describe lines as vector functions. And each component of your function, how you're going to know it's a line, is each component looks linear. Each component has the form mx plus b, right? So we're going to do something that looks like you know, at plus x0, and bt plus c0, and ct plus yz, and z0, right? So it looks like the mx plus b, where your t is like the variable, right? It's like the x, right? That's going to be a line, right? That's going to be, call it a vector r, or whatever we want to call it. That will be a line, because each component looks like this. <laughs> okay, so let's say someone comes to you and they're like, and they ask you, is that a line? <laughs> it's not a line. How come? How do you know? It doesn't look like that. <laughs> okay. I've seen people tell me some crazy things are lines in this class, and I'm Oh. I've seen people put exponentials in the thing and like, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> okay, like, don't want to put this on record, but I will tell you if you tell me something like that is online. Okay, now I just want to do that speech. Probably burn your paper if I see that. Equations of lines and planes, right? You ask an algebra student, what's the equation of a line? You expect them to be able to tell you. Same way, if I ask you what's the equation of a line, I expect you to be able to tell me right away. Make sure you know these formulas. Everything I'm going to put in a box in this section, you have to know them. Know them like, like this. And don't confuse them with something else that looks totally different and crazy. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the equation of a line. Turns out in three dimensions, vectors are the easiest way, pretty much, for us to locate things. Right? Position vectors are the easiest way for us to locate things. And we're pretty much, everything we know from before about like lines and curves, we're going to want to restructure them to talk about them in terms of vectors. And a line is a pretty basic kind of curve. We need to know what does a line look like. And that's what we're going to figure out now. So. <coughs> Talk about lines in R theorem. We're going to see how they look. So we are in three dimensions here. There's a random line. Now let's say I know a vector that describes the direction of this line. So V is like the direction vector for the line. parallel to the line, gives its direction. And let's say we actually know a point the line passes through. And so let's say I call that point x0, y0, z0. And so I know a point on the line, and I know the direction of the line. It turns out that I can actually find the equation of the line given these two, right? So let's say here x, y, z, 
is an arbitrary point. Right? Sort of like how when you're figuring out the equation of a straight line back in algebra, you just put x comma y as an arbitrary point on the line. What's the relationship between x and y? We're going to need what's to know what's the relationship between x, y, and z. So how we actually do that is we look at the vector that connects these two. And we sort of think, how can I actually write that vector? X minus x0. X minus blah, 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 right? So you do all that stuff. But um, can I describe it in terms of b? What would its relationship to b be? Parallel. It would be parallel, right? So I know v might have a different length, so I can scale it. So I can say this vector, call it a, it's just t times v, where t is some scale, right? So what we're going to do is now we're going to do look at position vectors. I'm going to hit a position vector to hit this guy, call that r0. Position vector to hit the arbitrary point, I'm going to just call that r. Right? So r0 is the position vector to locate the point I know the line passes through. r is just the vector that hits that point, the arbitrary point I want to describe. I want to describe what does r, the vector r do. Okay, so now we're going to move over here. So looking at the vectors r naught, r, and t, v, could you tell me a relationship between them? Any simple one. r0 plus t, v equals r. Right. r is actually r0 plus T V. Everyone loves T V. So R is just this random point, right? X, Y, C. What relationship must hold? Well, it has this point in it. X0, Y0, Z0. Plus T times V. Let's say I call V A, B, C. That's the vector of V. So I just described a line. I described to you what's the relation between x, y, and z in terms of vectors and the scalar. Right? This guy is the equation of a line in three dimensions. It is called, because we use vectors, it's called the vector form of the equation of a line. Know this. That's called the vector form for the equation of the line. You just need a point the line passes through. And I should actually write that down to emphasize. Notes. Find the equation. this down, make sure you know it. Okay. So the thing is, 10.5 is actually the first, I'd say the first non-trivial section that we're going to be doing. Like in this one, you're actually going to be like having to figure things out, like really. You know? It's really going to test if you can navigate the three dimensions in your mind, and we're going to talk about that later. The best way I think about doing it is knowing the basics, know what the formulas look like, and know exactly what you need to find something, right? So when you're finding a line, there's a couple of things you're going to need. When you're figuring out what a plane is, there are going to be a couple of things you're going to need. And you should know this. You should know, if I'm looking for a line, I need a point and a direction, right? 
and the direction should be parallel to the line, right? That's the important thing, right? So it's the direction of the line, you need a parallel vector. So if we need to find the equation of a line, what do we need? Point and direction of the line, right? Like when you're looking for a line, stop everything, that's what you need to find. I need a point the line passes through and the direction of the line. How do you know two vectors are orthogonal? Um, by the product of zero. zero. Okay, that was too shabby. Okay. I know it's parallel. Oh, no, it's zero. Zero. A little better, but we can, we'll work on it. <laughs> to find a line, what do I need? The point and the direction. Keep repeating that to yourself. Okay, all right. Let's move on. So it turns out we can actually write the equation of the line in several forms, and we're going to do it now. Notes. If I have x, y, z equals x0, y0, z0, plus t, a, b, c, turns out I can, I can actually, these two are vectors, right? I know scalar times a vector, I can just take that t and multiply it in, right? Yeah. And then I can just add the two vectors. What would that look like? It would look like x0 plus ta. Right. How would you know y over z plus z? I mean, yes, yeah, c, c, t. Right. Okay. So notice that each component looks like y equals mx plus b. That's how you know it's a line. If each component doesn't look like y equals mx plus b, it's not a line. Okay. Which means. We can equate components on the right and left. So basically, I can give you equations for x, right, and y and z, right? So x would be what? It's not plus at. Y would be y not plus bt. Z would be Z0 plus C T. Right? And see when you write this, when you write this list of equations, that's actually another form. I can actually list three equations to describe a line. This I call the parametric form. ask you to give the equation of a line in the parametric form, give the equation of a line in the vector form. Or you might be given a list of equations and you need to know what does that list of equations describe. Or you might be given a random vector function and you need to know what does that vector function describe. You need to know the forms, right? These aren't the only forms. There's actually another form. So we have the vector form for the equation of a line, we have the parametric form for the equation of the line, and notice here, one thing that's common to all three equations is the variable t, right, which we call the parameter. We're going to talk more about the parameters later on in parametric equations, but for now notice that we could solve for t. In that case, I would have t is equal to x minus x naught over a, as long as your a is non-zero. And I can get t is equal to y minus y naught over b. I can also get t is equal to z minus z naught over c. Which means, since t is equal to each of these, each of these must be equal, right? So I can literally write x minus x naught over a must be equal to y minus y naught over b must be equal to z minus z naught over c. This double equation is called the symmetric form of the equation of a line. So 
we're talking about the equation of line, we can talk about three forms. We can talk about the vector form, we can talk about the parametric form, we can talk about the symmetric form. You should be able to recognize when any one of these happen, right? Your x0, your y0, your z0, your a, b, and c, they will all be constants, right? Your t is a variable, and of course your x, y, and z, z are also variables consequently, because t is a variable, right? So t actually changes. If you change the value of t, you go to another point on the line, right? By taking all values of t, you get all points along the line. So that's basically how a line will work in three dimensions. It's not just your y equals mx plus b anymore. It's a little bit more complicated, but if you can remember the vector form that each component has to have that y equals mx plus b form, the others you should be able to get to pretty easy. So that you have to know. Know when something is a line and know when you're giving me an answer to a problem that should be a line, what it should look like. Okay. Let's actually do some examples here. I don't remember if I chose an example when this would come up, but let me just mention it first. What if A, B, or C are zero? Because right? remember, we can't divide by zero. So what if one of these end up zero? What, are, what does that mean? Right, so for example, let's say I have x is equal to 2 plus 3t, y is equal to 7 minus 4t, but my z is a constant 3. That's clearly a line. How do I write, say, the symmetric form? Do I max to write that in symmetric form? <clears throat> Turns out you do the same thing here. You have x minus 2 over 3 equals y minus 7 over minus 4. And since you can't actually divide by the coefficient of t here, what you do is you put a semicolon and you just write z equals c. So that's how it can change. Because you can't divide by it. Okay. Now let's move on to the examples. That wasn't an example, that was just Well, th that, that was an example. I just made that up though, just to show you how, how the notation can be affected. The symmetric form might be, the symmetric form might have trouble because it, it involves division and you have to worry about what if I'm dividing by zero, what do I do? That's what I do. Um, I was confused with when you're like, what if A, B, C are zero? A, B, or C are zero, right? So like here, the A, the B, or the C, what if it's zero? You couldn't actually write this down. Because dividing by zero is illegal, and it's blasphemy, and you'll get a zero on your test if you write it. Right. So you can't write it, <laughs> no matter what. Like, I don't know. I write, any, write anything but that. You know, Jesus saves, whatever. <laughs> it's, you'll, you'll fare better than writing something over zero. So if it's over zero, you just write a semicolon, write this. Okay. Um, now let's, let's talk about actual examples. Find the vector parametric, actually define all of them, and symmetric form of the line the line that goes through the point, one, two, three, and it's parallel to the vector minus one, zero, two. Let's say you have that information. I know it passes through the point one, comma, two, comma, three, and that's its direction. How do I actually find the line, the vector form? 
So those things I wrote in boxes, that, that, were, that was the answer to one of the bonus problems on the quiz. I don't know how many people re read ahead to figure that out. But okay. So it's the vector form. One, two, three, plus T, minus one, three, X, Y, Z equals one, two, three, plus T times minus one, three, two. All right, so this is like your x naught, y naught, z naught. This is your a, b, c, right? And you just plug it into the form. So that was the vector form. What about the parametric form? <coughs> so x would be equal to <coughs> 1 minus t. y would be equal to? Just 2, right? Because it's 2 plus 0 t. z would be equal to? 3 plus 2 times t. So that's the parametric form. What about the symmetric form? minus 1 over minus 1 equals, well, we'd skip the y because it doesn't have the right form. Jump to the z. z minus 3 over 2. Put the semicolon here. Just write y equals 2. So I did do an example. I was worried. Not so bad, right? Any questions on that? Let's make it a little more complicated, just slightly, not a lot. Find the equation of the line. line intersect the xy plane. Part C. Where does the line intersect the surface? y minus 3z equals 5. This is a plane, by the way, which we're going to talk about later in this section, what the equation of a plane is. So if you see a surface looking like this, it's actually a plane. find the equation of a line. I need a point and a direction. I have two points. I can choose from these points, right? But I don't have a direction. Right, so here, I need a point, which I can just pick minus 1, 2, 0. It doesn't matter which one of the points you pick. And a direction, which at the moment I don't know. How do I figure one out? Right, I know it has passed through two points, and I know how to create a vector that passes through two points, right? 
is 3 of final minus initial condition. So I can say my direction is going to be 3 minus a minus 1, comma, 1 minus 2, comma, 2 minus 0. So that's 4 minus 1, 2. This means the line is given by x, y, z, if I do the vector form. any plane. I could have said, what about the yz plane? Well, that means you said x equals 0. And you saw for t there, you plug it into the other two and get those coordinates. Right? That'll be fine. Part C. Where does it intersect that plane? Claiming that my line passes through this plane, what point does it do that? Yeah, you plug in the parametric. You need x, y, and z to obey these equations, but at the same time, they should obey that equation. So you simply just plug them in. So if I want my x to be minus 1 plus 4 t plus 2 times the y, which is 2 minus t, minus 3 times the z, which is 2t, equals 5. So what does that mean? Minus 1 plus 4t plus 4 minus 2t minus 6t must be equal to 5. So what do I have here? I have 4t minus 2t minus 6t. That's minus, give me a plus 2, that's minus 4t. And here I have 5 plus 1 minus 4. And so that's 6 minus 4, that's 2, which means my t should be minus a half, right? Which means my x is going to be minus 1 plus 4 times minus a half. My y is going to be 
2 minus a minus a half. My z is going to be 2 times minus a half. Mm -hmm. So this would be negative 3. My y would be huh? 5 over 2. And my z would be just minus 1. Mm -hmm. Right? So, the, so in this case, the intersection point would be minus 3, comma, 5 over 2, comma, minus 1. Questions? Okay, to recap, we need to find the equation of a line that passes through two points. What do you need for the equation of a line? A point and a direction. I'm given two points, so I just pick any one of them. To figure out the direction, how do I figure out the direction if I know two points? The final minus initial formula. Do that here, I get my v. Once I have a point and a direction, I just put this plus t times that. Right? This, of course, I write as a vector because I'm now thinking of that point as a position vector. That's how we derive the formula. Parametric just means I separate the components into x, y, and z, just write them separately. And then if I solve for the t, I set them all equal, like in the symmetric form. Um, in general, they'll ask you for a certain form. They say, write it in the vector form, write it in the parametric form. If they don't tell you, just write whatever you prefer. Personally, I like the vector form. It's the easiest one to. I have the point direction. I just put it here and put it here. It's just, you know, it's not bad. To find out where things intersect, you have to find out where there's an overlap. So where does it intersect the x, y plane? The equation of the xy plane is z equals 0. I need that to coincide with this, so I need the z here to be 0. Set the z equals 0, I solve for t, and I can use that to find the x and y. Um, some other plane would have given me a similar result. Um, I would have done it a similar way. If I'm given some general sur formula for a surface, all I need to do is make sure that the formulas that I got from here, the parametric forms, coincide there. Just plug them in, solve for the t, and that will give me the point. What if this guy had no solution? No parallel. It means they're parallel. They would never actually touch. Right? So oops. that question is actually a nice segue into what I'm about to do. We're going to talk about, well, <coughs> I'm going to get there. should be able to get there. But that's the equation of a line. We're going to talk about when things are, we say skew, which means they never touch. But before that, I want to mention something about line segments. Now what I'm going to mention about line segments, very important that you remember that. It's going to come back in 392, where you're going to just need to figure out the equation of a line like this in a couple seconds in order to do some problems. So pay attention to this section, line segments. Sometimes we only care about a section of a line. Sometimes I don't want the whole line. Just give me the part of the line that goes from this section point to that point. Right? So sure, there's a whole line going on in infinite directions, going on infinitely in both directions. But what if I only care about this piece? How do I find the equation of that piece? Right? So say the equation of the line that passes through the point R, R0 and R1. I only care about that line segment, that piece of the line. How do I actually represent that as an equation? Can you find it the same way you found the line before? Yeah, you can find the same way you found it before. What you need to do now is you need to make sure you put a restriction on the t, the parameter, right? So there's a certain t value that's going to give you this point, and then there's going to be another t value that's going to give you this point. And you just basically say, let t range from this to that. But let's say you actually don't know what the line is, but you know what two points you want the line to touch. It turns out that there's an easy way to get to it. 
Um, there's actually a formula for the line setting. This is pretty much a systematic way to do a line segment so you don't have to like figure it out all the time. Um, it's this guy. So it's 1 minus t times the first point plus the last point. Plus t times the last point. And this will always work for 0 to 1, right? So these go together, right? This is the formula, and you make t range from 0 to 1, and this will hit those points. So this is line segment connecting. Thought of as position vectors. What you'll notice is if you plug in t equals zero, what happens? That and that is gone, you just have the point r zero. If you plug in t equals one, then this goes away and you're left with r one. Right? So you realize that the line goes from r zero to r one. Um, so that's that. Um, there's a formula I like to use because you can sort of do it in your head really quickly and it impresses a lot of people. I don't know why. sort of unpacking the formula that we had before. Or, let's say R0 was the point, I put I for initial, X initial, Y initial, Z initial. R1 is the point, X final, Y final, Z final. And this, of course, extends. If it's only two dimensions, you just forget about the second point, right? But basically, your x is going to be, you start at the initial, and then you figure out the distance from the initial to the final, which is, again, final minus initial. y is going to be the same. y initial plus y final minus y initial times t. Z would be Z initial plus Z final minus Z initial times T. And here, T again goes from 0 to 1 for this formula, right? It's always 0 to 1 for this formula. They go together, right? That will actually create the line segment for you, right? It's equivalent to this, but I'm going to show you why this one. That one takes a little longer to get it in a nice form. But this you can sort of do it in your head, and then I'm going to show an example. So this stuff would only work if everything is in the first quadrant. No, this always works. Both forms always work, no matter what. And the equation of the line segment. Well, you wrote like zero, you basically wrote that t can't be less than zero or more than one. Yeah, I, it's like I chose that first and then I developed a formula that works with it. It's okay. not like I'm saying, it's, yeah, okay. it's not a location restriction, it's just a location of, I want nice numbers okay. to plug into this function. Right. So I pick zero and one and then I, afterwards I develop a form that works with zero and one all the time. Okay. Yeah. So segment from one to three to minus three zero three. Right? And it's a good way to define the direction that you want to move in as well. Right? So t equals zero is considered the initial point. T equals one describes the final point. Right? So let's do the first formula, method one. It's the formula in your textbook. Personally, I don't use this method. You'll see. I don't care if you use it or not, but I like using this one. It, it looks more complicated, but when you're actually doing it, it will be a lot quicker. So let's say we want to do it here. What would the equation of the line be? R of t would be... Right? I want to go from this to that, which means I'm thinking of this as my r0. That's my r1. 
So what's the formula going to be? 1 minus t times r0, right? 1, 2, 3, plus t times r1. That's it. The problem is it's not in any of the three forms that we had before, right? It's closest to the vector form, but it doesn't look exactly like the vector form, right? So what we can do is you start to figure it out, distribute, right? So 1 times this vector is just 1, 2, 3, minus t times this vector, 1, 2, 3, plus t times minus 3, 0, 3. times, and what you notice is going to happen is you're going to take the final vector minus the initial vector, right? So you could have just done that from the beginning. So minus 3, minus 1, is going to be minus 4, 0 minus 2, minus 2, 3 minus 3, 0. And so now we have the vector form. the vector form of the line. And if you define t goes from 0 to 1, is the important part. It ensures that you start here and you stop here. Right? Once you put that in. Right? This by itself is just the line going on forever. Once I tell you, let t start from 0 to 1. If I plug in t equals 0, I just have this point. If I plug in t equals 1, I end up with that point. Yes? Oh, I expanded. So it's 1 times this vector minus t times this vector. From the formula. It's, the, it's a general formula. this formula, the second formula. Um, essentially, um, start at the initial point, Formula and me explaining it sounds complicated, but when you actually do it, it's going to be attached to attach t to this number. need to add or subtract? Minus 4. Minus 4, put a t on it. Why? Where do I start? 2. What I need to add or subtract from 2 to get to 0? Minus 2. 3. I don't do anything to get to 3, so it's just that. 
Cross it past the line. T goes from 0 to 1. Right? So, um, especially in 392, parameters, parameterizing stuff is going to be something that you're going to be doing all the time. So to get to the parametric equations really quickly is going to be very important. And this is pretty much a lot quicker. So students are normally used to doing this, which is fine. But it takes you like two steps to be able to say x equals this plus that t, that x equals this plus that t. Right? It's much easier that you do this as far as I know. So another example, let's say I have 7, 0, minus 1, and I'm going to 1, 1, 3. So you can call this R0, call that R1, plug into that formula, distribute, get the answer. Or you can just say x equals 7 minus 6t, y equals t, z equals minus 1 plus 4t. So I started at 7, what do I need to get to 1? Subtract 6. If I start at 0, what I need to get to 1, I need to add 1. So it's 0 plus 1, t. Start at minus 1, what I need to get to 3, I need to add 4. So it's plus 4, t. Right? So I do that, and I'm like, OK, you know, we need to parameterize this line curve here. So it's x equals this, y equals this, y equals that. Let's do those two foods. This is easy. It's just that stupid formula. Right? I'm using a different formula from you all, so it looks so easy. And then I say, it's orthogonal, and everyone's oh, so <laughs> sophisticated. <laughs> I'm telling you the secrets now. So now you can like go show off to your friends. Your other friends in Cal 3, when they're doing that, this is it. Whoa, how'd you do that, bro? I don't know, it's orthogonal, man. I'm just orthogonal to <laughs> yeah. For that one, for the, the y value, yeah. do you have, does that have to be negative 1? Negative t or not? No, to get from 0 to 1, I add 1. You add 1 to 0. Right? So the y is going to be 0 plus 1 t. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's line segments. We'll need those every now and then in Calc 3, but in 392, you're going to be doing this like all the time, like parameterizing line segments all the time. Will they ever give you like a line and say, like, find the line segment from t is equal to this, t is equal to that? No, that would be. Because you wouldn't need to find anything. You just take the original equation and set t equals to this to t equals to that. There'd be nothing to do in that case. Okay, some notes. Two lines are parallel if, how do you know two lines are parallel? If you cross parallel to the zero. How do you cross parallel lines? Oh. <laughs> right, you cross parallel works with vectors. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. How do you know two lines are parallel? If, uh, the vectors are if their direction vectors are parallel. Yeah. So A, B, C. That, that seemed too simple to be right. <laughs> That's it. That's just how you know. You look at the V part, and if one is a multiple of the other, they're parallel. Right? Similarly, they are. So the direction vectors tell you a lot of information. You can know if something is parallel to something else. Right? It's the same way in, in algebra. You know two lines are parallel if they have the same slope. You know they're perpendicular if the product of the slopes is minus 1. Similarly here, you just look at the direction vectors for your line. If they're parallel, then the whole lines are parallel. If they're perpendicular, meaning if the dot product of their direction vectors is 0, you know they're perpendicular. They are orthogonal. So now, if their direction vectors are e, of 
function that gives out a zero. to note. How much time do we have? Also note two arbitrary lines They may neither intersect nor be parallel. In this case, we call them skew lines. three dimensions, there are three options. In two dimensions, you don't really have that many options. You only have two. The lines either they are parallel or they intersect at one point. Uh, in three dimensions, it's possible to have a third option where you know, like these two chalks are lines. I can have a line doing this and then a line doing that. They'll never, ever touch, even though they're not parallel. right? So they'll never touch. This goes forever in that direction. This goes forever in that direction. It's possible in three dimensions. In two dimensions, it's not. So how do you know when that happens? Well, the first one we know, right? How do you know they're parallel? You look at the direction vectors. Figuring out if they intersect at one, if they're not parallel, figuring out if they intersect at one point is a little more complicated. You have to set up a system of equations. Here. So the first line is x equals 6 minus 3, 2, y equals 3 plus 4, t, z equals 5 plus 4, t. Let's stop a little bit. That's the bottom line. 6 minus 3 minus 3 plus 2. That's the first line. The second line, you can write it as x equals 10 minus 6 k y plus 3 plus 4 k y equals 7 plus 4 k. Right, so here k is the parameter. I just don't want you to mix it up with the other two. Sometimes, as a question, they might write t in both, but you have to know, use a different variable for one of them. Otherwise, you'll get confused. OK, so are the two lines parallel, intersecting, or skewed? What do you think? Parallel. Parallel. Here, they're actually yeah, parallel. Parallel. 
Why? Because the direction vector for the first one is minus 3, 2, 4. The direction vector for the second one is minus 6, 4, 8, which is actually just 2 times v1. So these are actually parallel. Okay. B. x equals 4t plus 2, y equals 3, z equals minus t plus 1. The second line is x equals 2k plus 2, y equals 2k plus 3, z equals k plus 1. 4t plus 2, 3, minus t plus 1. 2 s plus 2, 2 s plus 3. Okay. I have a question about the question. But if the two, the parameters are different, the t and k, how can you say that they're parallel? I, I don't get that because I thought, but with different parameters, like you can't like say like the, the lines are the same. I never said they're the same. I no, said they're no, parallel. Okay. Then it starts like t at any point, like c could be equal to two and k could be equal to three, right? They don't yeah. have to match up. They don't have to coincide. No, they're just beside each other. That's possible. They could actually match up. Yes, but we don't oh, know that in okay. the beginning. So you know what? T equals one it might give you a point. This on the line, k equals one might give you a point somewhere completely different. Yeah, like but k is equal to like five. Yeah, maybe k equals 5 would be right under that one, it doesn't matter. Okay, so these, you'll check their direction vectors, you'll see that they're not parallel. Right, so here, v1 would be 4, 0, minus 1. v2 would be 2, 2, 1, not parallel. How do I check if they're intersecting? Not parallel. Oh, no. Yeah. I never asked about orthogonal. Okay. Um, how do you intersect these two curves? How do I know if they meet at a certain point? They equal each other. You said them equal to each other, right? Do the x, y, and z functions ever actually align? Right? So what you're going to do is you're going to check is 4t plus 2 equal to 2k plus 2 and is 3 equal to 2k plus 3 and is minus t plus 1 equal to k plus 1 at the same at the same instant right meaning you have to solve the system of equations and see is there a solution for k and t for which this works In other words, we have something like 4t minus 2k equals 0. And we have something like well, k would be 0. And so that would be equation 1, that would be equation 2. And this is minus t minus k. Plug in the when you know the k is equal to zero, so you plug that into the other two equations. Right. So how we do this? Notice that in this case you always have three equations, but only two unknowns. Right. So what you do is solve two first. Solve two simultaneously and check that it works in the third. So from equation 2, we get that k equals 0. Um, in equation 1, then I would have 4 times t minus 2 times 0 equals 0, which means t must be equal to 0. Right? So this means, so 
now you check in three, I have minus zero minus zero equals zero. So that checks out. This means t equals zero, k equals zero, give an intersecting point. And the point is Right. X would be 2, Y would be 3, Z would be 1. Right? So the point is just 2, 3, 1. So these two lines are not the same two lines, but they will actually meet at the point 2, 3, 1. How did you, how did you get K to 0? Would it be 2 here? Is it equal to 0? Right, then divide both sides by 2. Oh, right. Uh, and then, yeah, so k equals 0. Plug it in here, I get t equals 0. If I plug both zeros in here, I do get 0, so the third one checks out, and then yeah. that will work. Maybe there are times where you can solve these two and you get an answer, but when you plug it into third, it won't work, <coughs> which means they're skewed, which is, was actually my next example, but we don't have time for it. Oh, wait. For that one, the negative t minus negative k, which from the third equation, I just move the k over. I can, I, if I wrote k plus t, just be easier, it's still the same, right? Yeah. Right, sure. No questions, we can stop there. We'll pick up next time. I guess we'll do MATLAB, because Mark keeps giving me the eye. We're going to do MATLAB, John. Mm -hmm. okay. I really wanted to get to vector code before I did it, but I guess we can do some stuff in MATLAB. And sort of draw some stuff in. Yeah. So we'll continue this lesson next time. There's no, there are no, there's no class on Thursday because Thursday is a Monday. So Friday we have MATLAB. We'll can pick up, pick this up next week. Whenever. Oh yeah, pass up your homework. I forgot to ask.